Hello and welcome to Best Sips Worldwide. I'm your drinking companion, Susan Schwartz, an American travel writer living in London. Thanks to my mother's love of martinis, the first words I spoke were shaken, not stirred, and I've been obsessed by the history of cocktails ever since. Through the years, I've been lucky enough to sip some of the best made by the best. Hear that sound? It's time to cozy up to the bar and let me introduce you to the movers and shakers of the world's most famous watering holes. Hope you had the most wonderful summer. Welcome back to Best Sips Worldwide. Where were you August 10th, 2010 at 10 minutes past 10? Well, those in the know, like Anna Sebastian, were at the reopening of the Savoy Hotel after its major three-year refurb. As bar manager at the Savoy's Beaufort Bar, newly built for this special day, she reigns over one of the most famous bars in the world. Lucky for us, she had time for a chat. It's a, it's a, bit, of a, a bit of a mix of a journey. Um, when I left school, I didn't really know what I wanted to do, and one of the options that was presented to me at the time was to go and join the army. And I just thought, well, why not? And I applied and I got through and went through the different um, stages that you have to go to. Oh, boy. And uh, so it was slightly different. And, um, That's I not thought, what I expected you to say. No. <laughs> I thought, well, why not? Let's give this a go. And I got my place and I was um, sponsored by the Royal Artillery. And then uh, for you know, life happens and I had deferred it for a year. And during that year, I started working in bars and nightclubs. And I remember really, really specifically one evening, and I walked into this club in in Soho, just off Carnaby Street. And I was sitting there, and I saw this guy walked in, and he just had... He wasn't the the biggest guy or the most sort of good-looking guy, but he walked in, and he just sort of had this presence about him. And he just sort of linked all the different elements of the room together. And he knew everybody, and people knew him, and even if they, even though they didn't really know him, they knew who he was, and just had this sort of presence, and linked all the different elements, like the music and the atmosphere and the drinks, just linked everything together, and I just went, wow, gosh, what does he do? How does he do that? And that sort of got me sort of thinking. Um, the army sort of career never worked out, um, but in some ways that was a big blessing, so I found myself working in hospitality without even sort of realizing that I was working in hospitality so for years I was working in nightclubs and all this is back when you know China Whites was really big Browns was in the day all of these clubs and I was working on the door as uh, front of house as a host and uh, looking after the guest list and working and being almost you know the face of the club and at the same time I started working for a PR agency and the two combined really sort of gave me a really good understanding of the front of house side of things, but also what happens behind the scenes, how you market, how you PR, how you generate you know, an, a, a profile of who you are. And I had an amazing time and working PR, I think, gave me a really interesting insight into how business sort of worked. How old were you at this time? So this must have been around, I, this was between the ages of 18 and 23. That's young. So I was, still quite, I was still quite young, but I was just really determined to make my mark and on whatever I did. And it got to the stage where working at the PR agency, I'd achieved everything that I wanted to achieve. And I thought, you know what, I need to, I need to do something different. And I saw that the Savoy was reopening. And the Savoy, for me, had always been something you know, that I'd always known about. Growing up in London, I'd always known about. And um, I'd been there, I think the first time I went there was when I was 11 for a party in the ballroom and I remember coming up in the taxi and getting out and getting you know, driving on the wrong side of the road and getting out and um, I remember the bright lights of it so it's always been in the background and I saw a position as a host in the American bar and I just went wow this sounds good uh, let's give it a go but I don't think I realized the magnitude of what was really happening and what it meant for the Savoy which had been closed for just under three years to reopen so I turned up on my first day and I, didn't, I still didn't really sort of realise and I walked into the American bar and the first two people that I met were Eric, he's still the head um, bartender of the American bar and um, another bartender, a very good bartender called Swanee. And I remember meeting them and that was my first sort of image of the Savoy. 
and it just became like this whirlwind and we were in this training and we were all building up to the reopening which was on the 10th of October 2010 Mm -hmm. to open at 10 minutes past 10 and still during this time I was just hadn't really clicked what I was what I was part of and what we were about to do and then I remember being in uh, the day that we were opening I was scheduled on for an, a late shift but I came in because I wanted to see the opening and I remember standing in the front hall with our with my leader at the time um, the American bar manager Daniel and standing there and watching the reopening and then just like being told to right go upstairs and you know be be on the door and seat the guests and it just after that it just merged into this big long time there which was amazing and I think Throughout that time, I, that was the moment that I realised what hospitality was. It wasn't just about giving good service. It was about creating an atmosphere and creating a moment for people. And it honestly was, I think that year really defined who I was as a person. And um, I just absolutely loved it. I wouldn't change it for the world. And just working with... You know, such talent. I think I was told that 26,000 people applied for jobs and 600 people got jobs. So that's around about 50 oh people per job. And obviously the American bar gained that sort of reputation of, you know, it only has had 11 head bartenders um, in the last 128 years. It's, mm-hmm. So it's an incredible, I mean, that's an incredible thing in itself. And, you know, we were working with some of the best people. Um, one of the old head bartenders, Salim Khoury, came back as front of house to link the old Savoy to the new Savoy. So he was the one that actually trained me being on the door. So just being able to have his knowledge and experience was invaluable. And what what were the clients like for you as a first timer being in this, you know, palatial hotel? I mean, yeah. how did, did the, because this was your first experience, I guess, in the front of the house, except for working at, um, Clubs. In nightclubs, yeah. Um, I mean, nightclubs are a different world, uh-huh. and I got great experience from that. But you really don't know who's going to come into the Savoy, and it's such an eclectic mix of people. And there are, I mean, to this day, there are certain guests that I remember so vividly from my first sort of six months. And those guests have come back year after year after year, and you really get to know them, and they get to know you. You kind of grow up with them in a way. But you can't pinpoint a type of guest because every single person was so different Mm -hmm. and I think when the hotel reopened there was such a high expectation because it's a Savoy you know people have so many memories attached to this place it's been handed down from generation to generation to generation and it's it's down to us to write the next chapter so there's a lot to live up to and there's you know the expectations are very very high and you know sometimes we sometimes we get it wrong and that's you know when you hold your hand up and you go you know we made a mistake or you know, maybe there were no free tables available, but that is, it's, that's live and it's how we deal with it next that I think makes, makes a difference. But the clientele, it's so, I mean, even now to this day, it's, you, you just never know who's going to walk through, walk through the doors. Of course not. Now, did you go behind the bar? Have you been a bartender? In, in some ways, yes. You know, I would never claim to be an amazing, you know, a bartender, but by trade, but I have worked behind bars. One of the first bars that I worked at was this little bar in Islington. I've done a lot of festival bartending as well. But my forte is the front of house, Mm -hmm. um, the service on the floor, the guest interaction. Um, We have amazing bartenders here and I would never be, I would never compete with them. But it's, all of us in the bar have learned how to make all the drinks. You know, we can, if it's a busy night, I'm very happy and very comfortable going behind the bar, making the drinks from all of the ones that we have on our menu to all of the classic drinks as well. But where I feel that I'm best and best place is the front of house side of things. And do you feel being front of house that, you know, this is a particularly male dominated um, uh, job? People usually when you walk into a bar it's a man behind the bar and have there been any challenges with that for you as front of house I think you know, being in a male dominated industry it is it is it's very very interesting I think as a female and I think in, in any industry you really have to create your your own identity and I think that's really really important to do from from the start and that means you know you have your standards you know you know what's right you know what's wrong and you have to stick to that I think not only 
in I mean in any job you have to be as good if not better than than your than your peers Mm -hmm. Um, I think more and more now things are changing. For me, I see it as quite a positive thing. It's changing quite rapidly. You know, more and more people are, you know, girls are winning cocktail competitions, winning awards at Tales of the Cocktail, at the Spirited Awards each year. And I think that's really, really important as well. And I think, you know, I think if anything, being being female in this industry is an advantage because you are slightly more in the minority as well. But I think it just depends on the individual. You have to make your sand. You have to create your own identity as well. So Has long- that led to any surprises to you? Like, um, I think, I mean, this industry is full of surprises. Uh-huh. Just the same as you don't know who's going to walk through your doors. But I think once you establish yourself, then, and you're confident and you're happy and you're comfortable with what you do, then I think that's when people start to take notice and you know take you seriously as well. But I think the industry is evolving and it's changing so much, even on a daily basis as well. So I don't see, for me, I don't see it being a challenge. I think it's something to embrace and something to, you know, just like when I wanted to join the army, that's a very male-dominated industry. Mm-hmm. But you have to, you know, you have to make sure. When I was doing the training there, there's certain fitness levels that are for male and female and you have to make sure that you hit those targets and the rules shouldn't be different for male or female you should be able to do exactly the same and do the same job without you know being male or female affecting what you do oh no I totally agree um and and have you have now transitioned to the Beaufort bar being the yes bar manager here yeah um is that quite different from what you were doing at the American bar you know tell us a little bit of difference about the American bar versus the Beaufort bar? Of course. So, you know, I was, I was very, very lucky with my transition here. It happened, um, it happened very, very sort of quickly. And I came from the American bar. Um, at the time, I was a bar supervisor that I'd moved up from host to bar supervisor. And then I came down to the Beaufort bar. I mean, the basic things are very, very different. You know, the American bar is open during the day. It's a very classic hotel bar. It has over 100 years worth of history. Uh, whereas the Beaufort Bar was a new addition to the hotel when we reopened in 2010. We're a late night bar. It's a very beautiful bar. It's black and gold. It's a very sexy, sophisticated, elegant bar. The drinks are very different. The American Bar do amazing sort of mo- classics, modern classics with innovative sort of twists. Here I would say the cocktails are much more sort of theatrical. Um, we have ca- our range of character cocktails as well. So we have our equivalent of a martini trolley where the trolleys get pushed to the table. And whilst the drinks are made at the bar, the finishing touches and the presentations are done at the table. So essentially, we're bringing the bar to the table and having that touch of theatre as well. Um, The site that the Beaufort Bar is actually on is the former entertainment room of the hotel. So this is where everybody from Carol Gibbons to Frank Sinatra to the Savoy of Ians played. So where the bar is now actually used to be where the bandstand used to be. So whilst this bar is new, the room itself is embodied with this rich history of theatre and performance. And that is very much reflected, I think, in our cocktails and with what we do as well. The menu that you have now is this fabulous pop-up menu. And I guess that's why, as we were talking before, there are a lot of character cocktails on the menu. Yes. Was that because of... The history of this room? Yes, yeah, very much so. I mean, our pop-up menu was created by our old head bartender, Chris Moore, who came up with this idea and we launched it two years ago. The actual inspiration for this menu was he found this amazing um, brochure advertising the Savoy Hotel in the States. It was a map of London and in the middle was a pop-up of the Savoy and he sort of thought, how can I take this but make it into something that is relevant and interesting in the current world that we live in. And that's where the pop-up menu came up, um, you know, the idea came from. And we wanted to include our character cocktails, you know, these famous guests who have this huge association with the hotel. So Frank Sinatra, Coco Chanel, Ernest Hemingway, Marlena Dietrich, all of these people really shaped what the hotel was then and is today as well. And these cocktails are allow our you know, team to have that interaction with that guest, that engagement as well. And uh, just when the trolley comes to the table, the guests absolutely love it. And it is just something, it's very unique. It's completely different as well. It, you know, it's incredible. I'm grabbing one of these menus and it is literally a pop-up book that 
it has uh, well, how many are there, how many uh, cocktails are there in it? So there's 15 drinks uh -huh. on the menu, and they are just creations. I mean, I saw that you had a paper engineer work yes. on it. And how long did it take? So the whole the whole from idea to the actual execution was around about 18 months. Mm -hmm. It is one of the most beautiful menus I've ever seen. Thank and you. And I am just popping up to the um, to the Frank Sinatra one. And maybe you can tell me, which is literally a um, this, this is it. Yes, a keyboard with his face and a microphone. Yeah. I mean, it is so fabulous. Well, and the cocktails themselves were they created with the history of Frank Sinatra behind them? Very much so. I mean, we looked, there was a lot of research into it from the bartending team of what these characters liked, what they drank. And Frank Sinatra um, was known for his love of Jack Daniels mm -hmm. and so much so that he was actually buried with a bottle of Jack Daniels. So this was very much the starting point for this drink and something that we wanted to be reflected and when he sat to play the piano he had a bottle of Jack Daniels next to him and he never wanted anybody to pour it he'd pour it himself so this drink is actually served in one of our vintage glasses and next to it is a mini bottle of the cocktail as well so the guests can either it. take that away with them or pour it into the drink and finish the drink here but this cocktail in particular um, is, is very important for us I mean about three nearly four years ago now uh, Frank Sinatra Jr. actually performed in this very, very room, just on the stage, just where the bar is now. Um, and that was a really nice link, obviously, with his father staying here a lot of the time and sitting and playing the piano into the small hours of the morning. Oh, that must have been incredible. It, it was absolutely amazing. And just to be able to have that and host that in the hotel as well. Uh -huh. And the Ernest amazing. Hemingway one, The Never Ending Story, which has a copy of The Old Man in the Sea, his cigar, his face. It's just, it's so wonderful. It's, um, I mean, th this is a great one. This uh, one's very sort of interactive as well. This is one of my favorite drinks that we, that we have on the menu. So this takes inspiration from the different drinks that he used to have. For example, the daiquiri in Cuba, um, Death in the Afternoon in Paris, which was uh, absinthe and champagne. Um, so lots of all those flavors combined into one drink. And this is, this is served on, um, the coaster is actually a book of, that he wrote, um, The Never Ending Story, um, and The Old Man in the Sea. And this is um, served in a, um, next to it with a ashtray with a smoking cinnamon, which represents a cigar that he would have smoked sitting in Cuba enjoying, enjoying his daiquiri as well. I love it. And um, a little later, you're going to make the impressionist for me. Yes. So why don't you tell us what that is? So this is probably this is a cocktail that's been on the menu from day one. It's probably our most popular cocktail, certainly the most Instagrammable cocktail that we have on our menu <laughs> as well. Um, so this is a Grey Goose based cocktail with Cherry Marnier, a violet liqueur and a homemade raspberry syrup topped up with Runart Rosé Champagne. It's served with a smoking rose and this cocktail was actually inspired by Claude Monet. He used to do paint from one of the floors of the hotel overlooking London. And he was very, very famous for saying um, London would not be as beautiful without its fog. Um, so the smoking rose sort of represents that, but also the smoking rose, it, it uh, exudes the smell of uh, rose and jasmine water as well, which matches obviously some of the flavors in the cocktails. It's very interactive sensory experience as well. Now you hinted a little about a new menu. Yeah. How long has this pop-up menu been on? So this has been, we've been using it since October 2014. So we launched it at the beginning of London Cocktail Week. And it's a limited edition menu, so there's only a thousand copies. So we are very much coming to the end of, of this. So about four months ago, we started work. We came up with an idea. And we wanted something that would link with the pop-up menu. So there'd be that continuity. But we wanted also something that hadn't been done before. And that was very, very different as well. So I can't really reveal too much about it, but it is going to be just as uh, groundbreaking as this, something that hasn't been done before, something that is going to engage guests as well, but will also take you on a journey as well. Um, so it's going to be slightly more drinks on the menu. Um, we are still going to keep our character cocktails, but they will be changing for new characters that have frequented the hotel. So it is quite a big project that we've been working with. We've been working with um, different artists, um, still be working with a paper engineer, but in a different entity. Um, but it's all very exciting. Our new head bartender, Kyle Wilkinson, who joined us about three months ago, is leading this project um, with the rest of the bar team, um, which is very, very exciting. 
to be part of and to uh, to see how it's developing as time goes on. And when will that menu? Be so announced? we'll be looking towards the end of this year. Yeah. It depends, obviously, on the printing, how long that will take, and the external things. But it's um, I think it's going to be a very very strong menu. So we're very really excited, and we're really excited to be able to show people how how we've progressed over the last couple of years as well. That sounds fabulous. Can you picture a place? I mean, you've been at the Savoy, which is one, if not one of the greatest bar in the world, one yeah. of the greatest hotels with the greatest bar in the world. Um, where do you see yourself going? I think that's a hard question oh. because, I mean, where do you go from the Savoy? It's uh, This is an amazing place. And I think everybody that comes and works here gets so much from it. And you really develop yourself uh, professionally but also really personally as well you know you learn a lot of life skills as well I mean I always say that once I have achieved everything that I want to achieve then it's time to move on but right now there's still so much that I want to do here and as I mentioned earlier with you know, we halfway through started work on our new menu and our new concept that's something that is very much of a team project at the moment and something that I'm really excited about so right now it's my future now lies here at the Savoy. I mean, who knows what's going to happen? Who knows what's going to happen? But you know, this is an amazing place, and it's it's a very hard place to leave. I think it it does a lot for a lot for us all, and it's amazing to be part of something that has so much history and means so much to so many people. And you know, I always say, you know, we get the opportunity to make a difference to people you know we're not saving lives none of us are doctors but we get the opportunity to make a difference to someone's experience when they walk through those doors and that I think is is such a, an honor in a way to be able to do that thanks so much to Anna for being with us pop on down to see the pop-up menu at the Beaufort bar before the new year is out and channel Frank Claude and Papa Hemingway up next week, we toast to Mexican independence with a glass of 100% agave tequila, thanks to Nikki Stringfellow, UK brand ambassador to Casa Heredora, one of Mexico's most historic and renowned tequila producers. Viva Mexico! Until next time, bottoms up. For more information and links to everything you've heard about, plus a bit more, please visit bestbitsworldwide.com. Thanks for listening to Best Sips Worldwide, a spin-off of Best Bits Worldwide. Always remember the wise words of Oscar Wilde, all things in moderation, including moderation, and never drink and drive. Okay, I said that last part. Theme music is by Stephen Shapiro and used with permission. You'll find me at the bar 